EGFRs, spirit study? So the, the spirit study is, is again a large phase two randomized study. Uh, and it, it actually was trying to address the question, you know, the prior studies addressed the question of VEGF beyond VEGF inhibition. This one actually looked at penitimumab added to Fulfiri versus Fulfiri uh, plus, uh, plus BEV in patients who actually previously failed oxaliplatin and BEV. So this was a VEGF inhibitor, first line uh, as a requirement, and then the second line patients get randomized to penitimumab, EGFR inhibitor, or uh, BEV. And this is for wild-tap KRAS. And wild-tap KRAS in the study was defined as we still define it, i.e. KRAS 12 and 13. So not the all RAS mutation yet. So this study, interestingly, did not find a difference between the two. So BEV beyond progression, or PANI beyond BEV progression, ended up in a dead heat that hazard ratios were completely similar, that were about one, uh, and no statistical significance difference. So very intriguing study. The response rate was, was higher with the antique and penitumumab. Uh, or fulfiri penitumumab versus fulfiri bebasuzumab. But nonetheless, if you blind, blind uh, anyone to, this, uh, to, 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 to what this study was about, and you do not disclose that this was a second line study, interestingly, on both arms, the numbers look pretty much like first line numbers, right. the survivals and all that. So I think that I haven't made up my mind yet on this study before we see more mutational, RAS mutational analysis, which may actually if, if the trend continues as we've seen with the prime and the peak, which may actually lead uh, to a subgroup of patients that may, and I, this is all speculations, of course, change how we look at this study. But today, as we have it and as we do practice, this does not change how, how we practice, meaning that, uh, as, as, as you've heard, VEGF beyond VEGF uh, progression uh, seems to still be one of the favorite standards. So biologics all the way through? So you're giving one in first line. Does this say we pretty much have one to give in second line for everybody? And we'll talk about third line. I do think, although not all biologics are born equal, and I want just to highlight about the mechanism in vitro at least of zif aflibercept is not exactly another bevacizumab. It's not the story of penetumumab and cetoximab that we confuse. Maybe there is more of other like placenta growth factor, VGF, be other ligands that can be trapped by the VHDAP may be more benefit, but again, more studies are needed. Need biomarker there. Yeah. Um, Axel, let's shift gears to now third line, <coughs> because we've used most of the cards, uh, most, moved most of the chess pieces. There's a new one on the table, thanks to you and others, the correct study. Tell us yeah. about that trial quickly. So, correct was a last line study. Patients had failed or had, had not benefited or couldn't tolerate any of these standard therapies. And we randomized two to one to regorafenib, a multi-kinase inhibitor or placebo. And the study was positive, led to the approval of regorafenib, uh, actually now around the world, hazard ratio for survival of 0.77, and with an interesting shape of the progression-free survival curve, indicating that there might be a subgroup of patients that does not benefit and a subgroup that might benefit. And now the study for me actually has three major takeaways. Number one, we have a new treatment option for patients in a last line setting, which uh, we didn't have before. So it kind of adds another puzzle, puzzle piece to our Lego blocks. The second point is um, we can run trials in a last line setting very effectively, even a placebo control. I mean, this was one of the most successful trials in terms of accrual numbers. The study was supposed to enroll 690 patients in 26 months and enrolled 760 patients in 10 months, 60 months ahead of schedule. When we announced that we'll close the trial in seven days, we had 130 patients registered, even patients in the United States. They are dying. They are re study. It's an unmet need yeah, in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And the third is, you know, that kind of this myth, you know, that multi-kinase inhibitors don't work in colorectal cancer was refuted because. Um, or should I say refudiated, um, because they were normally in conventionally tested in combination with chemotherapy, and that is the lesson, the takeaway. If you test them in the right context, you might actually have a show that they work. To me, the answer is you just put a fluorine on anything and it becomes works I mean, in GI like cancers, right? Versus <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think it is in, informative. I think the problem now, of course, is it it's make it somewhat harder to develop drugs in this space down the road because this is not a selected population. 
population. We're having the same issue. Many of our early phase clinical trials say you must have received all treatments right. for colorectal cancer. And I sometimes would rather do a phase one, some of our newer stuff, than this drug. In fact, I mean, at our studies, we do allow for decisions between the patient and the physician to not to withhold to regorafenib down. until after the therapy. And, and I completely agree with that. I mean, you know, I do believe there is a way of drug development and opening before regorafenib. On the other end, we shouldn't wait too long because if patients are too beat up by their tumor, they have probably no chance to benefit from regorafenib.